Anyone who's uh, ever listened to me lecture for any period of time uh, quickly realizes that I love the Old Testament scriptures because we find in the pages of the Old Testament uh, narratives that I find gripping and poignant and moving because they involve real live people in real life struggles as they seek to develop their personal relationship with God. And one of, uh, I think, the most moving stories that we find in the Old Testament is the story of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. We remember that in the second chapter of uh, the first book of Samuel, we read the song of Hannah that is so closely compared with Mary's Magnificat in the Old Testament. And there are all kinds of parallels between those two women. But the song of celebration and of joy that Hannah sung in the Old, sang in the Old Testament was in response to God's answering her prayer. And what we're going to be looking at in the next few sessions is a Christian approach to prayer. And I want to do this from a practical perspective because I am acutely aware that many people in the Christian world struggle with this whole matter of prayer. And that people carry a lot of guilt around with them because they feel that they have not been proficient and consistent in their prayer lives. And even a cursory reading of the pages of Scripture reveals that the saints of old were people who were characterized by a consistent life of prayer. And so what I want to be concerned with in the uh, hours to come is the question, how can we learn how to pray like the biblical saints of old? And I want to start by looking for just a moment at this episode that is recorded for us in uh, 1 Samuel concerning Hannah. Hannah had been married and her life's desire was to bear children, but we are told in the first chapter that the Lord God had closed her womb. And her rival provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her, and therefore she wept and did not eat. And then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why are you not eating? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And Hannah was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Now you get the scenario here, that Hannah is miserable. And her condition has not been ameliorated over a period of years. And her life had been... Uh, scorned by her rivals to the point of bitterness. And so uh, her husband sees her and, and is concerned that she is so downcast and says, what's the matter with you? It's okay that we don't have any children. Don't I count for anything? I would hope that I would mean to you as much as ten sons. But it wasn't enough for Hannah. She wanted to be a mother. And so there, she comes to the tabernacle where Eli is ministering to the people. And we are told that she prays out of a spirit of anguish. Now, the New Testament tells us that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But that man there is generic. That is that uh, so we could translate that to mean that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous person availeth much. It's not just male prayers that are efficacious. But notice that when we are told that in the New Testament, that one of the keys to 
effective praying is that the prayers be fervent, that they not be desultory, that they not just be casual, but that when people expect to have answers to prayer, they have to come into the context of prayer meaning business. I mean, if God were to walk into your house this afternoon and you wanted to talk with him or to beseech him, to implore him for some action or to extol him for his greatness or to confess your sins, what would be the state of your soul in that conversation? It would certainly not be dull and casual. When, when people and old entered into conversations with God, like Jacob, they wrestled with God. They stayed at it all night. They were persistent. They were zealous because their concerns that they brought before God came out of the depths of their own agony, out of the anguish of their situation, and so they cried out, out of the depths of their heart, to God. And that's what happens with Hannah. In bitterness of soul, she prays to the Lord, and she wept in anguish, and she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the infliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And Eli, therefore, thought that she was drunk. And so Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And her prayer was answered. It was a prayer that she didn't even utter audibly. It was a prayer that she lifted up silently. She moved her lips as she prayed, but she was addressing God who can hear the interior cry of her soul from her heart. Just last night, I spoke with a woman who was married to a minister. And she said, you know, my husband has a ministry of the word, but my ministry is a ministry of prayer. And she says she spends her days in prayer. And she says she finds herself speaking out loud even when she's in the supermarket going down the aisle. She's sending up prayers to God, praying for the people of the congregation. She, sometimes people look at her like she's crazy. She's not crazy. She's discovered the secret of, of prayer. Now, I have to take a moment now to give a contrast between the prayer of Hannah and its result. And the first time I can remember in my life really praying hard, praying out of my soul's concern and anguish. But I want us to preface this by telling you also that the prayers that I prayed on this occasion were not the prayers of a believer. This prayer that I can remember was uttered and prayed by me in a chapel on my knees with great fervency when I was not even a believer in Christ. The occasion was uh, the birth of my sister's firstborn child. I was in high school, and my sister went into the hospital to have her child, and we were called to the hospital late at night because after she delivered her son, she began to hemorrhage. 
and the doctors were not able to stem the hemorrhaging. And so her life was in great danger. And when we came into the hospital, I was not allowed to go up to her room. I mean, it was such an emergency situation that none of the family uh, were allowed to be in her presence at that time. And so I can remember being in the lobby of that hospital, and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. There were no other visitors around. It was dark, and it was absolutely silent. And I knew that she was on the sixth floor. And I also knew enough about this hospital that on the basement was the hospital morgue. And I went to the chapel and I prayed that my sister would live. And then after I finished praying, I came and stood in front of that elevator and I watched the needle as it would go from their various floors. And on one occasion, I saw the elevator open its doors on the lobby level and I saw a body with, that had been covered with a sheet and they, then I saw the doors close and it went down to the morgue. And my heart uh, was uh, terrified. And so then I watched and watched, and I saw the thing go to the sixth floor, and I watched the arrow come down, and it passed up the lobby and went down to the basement. And again, I was terrified that it was carrying the body of my sister. So I went back into the chapel, and I cried. I was by myself, and I was on my knees, and I was begging God. I said, please, God, don't take my sister's life. And the doctors were able to stop the hemorrhaging, and she survived. I don't know that I ever went back, got on my knees to say thank you. If there was such a thing as foxhole religion or crisis praying, that's what I had experienced. It really betrayed that I knew there was a God even before I had committed my life to Christ or had become a Christian. And prayer was not a part of my life. But when life and death was in my face, I retreated to something that should have been natural and regular and a daily practice of me in my life. The next prayer that I can remember praying on my knees was three years later when I prayed beside my bed and asked God to forgive me of my sins and the night that I was converted. But I, I can remember from the very beginning of my Christian life loving the times that I had in personal communion with God. There was an intimacy about it. And I ha I've had many experiences in my life of spending eight hours solid in prayer. Don't get me wrong, do, don't do that every day. But I have had many experiences of that. And there is nothing like that. But I learned that concept of prolonged praying and, and intense praying when I was a college professor in the first year of my teaching. I taught in the same uh, college that I had graduated from. And it was a small town. It was an old Presbyterian college. And there was a section of the town that had housing for retired missionaries. And there was one gentleman who was in his late 80s who was a retired medical missionary, and his name was Dr. Jamison. And Dr. Jamison was considered by those of us of the younger generation as a bona fide, authentic Christian saint. He had practiced medicine on the mission field again for decades, but now he had reached the place in his life where he had suffered from certain illnesses and he was infirm. He could no longer practice medicine. It was never his plan or desire to retire. But he couldn't work anymore. And so what he did at this stage of his life was he devoted himself to a new vocation. 
His second career was that of the intercessor. He said, I can still work eight hours a day. And so what Dr. Jameson did day in and day out, eight hours every day, was be on his knees. He's what we call a prayer warrior. Now let me tell you something. When we had concerns, when I was living in that town, and we wanted people to pray for us, who do you think I wanted to have pray for me? You, you got it. I would go straight to Dr. Jameson's house and knock on the door and said, Dr. Jameson, would you pray for me? Yes, of course. And I knew that when he said he would pray for me, that he would in fact pray for me. I think of James in the New Testament, the author of the epistle to James, who according to early church history uh, and the best sources that we have from antiquity was in fact the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was known in the early church uh, by two names, two nicknames. One of his names was James the Just because he developed a reputation for an extraordinary level of personal righteousness. And this was a fellow who wasn't converted to his brother until after his brother was raised from the dead. And he went from skeptic to believer to the title James the Just. But his other nickname, I think, was even more revealing. And his other nickname, according to uh, antiquity, was Old Camel Knees. Old Camel Knees. Now, I recently spent some time with uh, uh, my grandchildren in Virginia. And we were sitting around a table, and my grandkids were playing, and they looked at me, and they, they called me Pap, and they said, Pap, uh, how come your face looks like leather? <laughs> That's out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> so, you know, most people don't come up to me and say, why does your face look like leather? <laughs> but they must be thinking it, if this is what my grandchildren are coming up with. And, and I said, well, I'm not sure, you know, maybe it's because it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, overworked. Remember, my mouth is 95 years old in terms of the miles it has on it. I said, so I've been tanned, I guess, over, over the years. Well, no one ever accused me of having leather knees. But the phrase old camel knees was ascribed to James, the brother of Jesus, because he had calluses on his knees from spending so much time in prayer. Now, not everybody is called to a ministry of prayer like Dr. Jameson. And not everybody prays with the intensity and persistence of a Hannah. But every one of us has a capacity for growth in our prayer life. And one of the things that's, that I find a little bit uh, sad is that we tend to look at prayer as a sacred duty, merely as a duty. And the quickest way I know to get people not to like something is to set it forth to them as an obligation because then it becomes a burden, and we can lay guilt trips upon people and so on. But in, in reality, yes, prayer is a duty. I, I can't deny that it is a duty. We, sh we are called and commanded by Christ and the apostles to be constant in prayer. We have that mandate before us, but we already know it's our duty, and so I'm not going to uh, spend time talking about our obligation to pray. What I want us to see is the opportunity that it brings to us. How sweet it is for our lives to be engaged, to have the opportunity to come into the actual presence of God Himself and to speak to Him. And to speak to Him from the deepest level of our concerns 
and of our hearts. And we should not be considering ourselves failures simply because we haven't uh, been all that successful in achieving a consistent prayer life. I think the basic reason why we haven't, in many cases, is not because we have no desire to have fellowship with God or to commune with God. It's not because we don't have enough time. That's not our problem. It's not because we lack discipline. All those things may be true, but those aren't the main reasons why we fall short of what uh, we could achieve or enjoy in prayer. I think the main reason is we don't know how. We don't know how to pray. And that doesn't surprise me when we will see later on when we look at the Lord's Prayer that the one thing that the disciples of Jesus asked their teacher for extra credit, for extra homework assignments. I mean, there aren't too many students that go up to their, their teachers and say, thanks for all you've taught me so far, but how about teaching me a little bit more? The one time we see them coming to Jesus and asking for a graduate course is what? Lord, teach us how to pray. And I'm convinced the reason they asked that, or two reasons why they asked that. First of all, because they didn't know how. And second of all, they saw that Jesus did know how. They observed him. They watched him go off by himself, never making an ostentatious display of his piety. They noticed that Jesus was not at all like the Pharisees who paraded their spirituality before everybody, praying at every opportunity in such a pious uh, display, because they were trying to gain the approval of men. But Jesus didn't do it that way. He got by himself quietly, intimately, he poured out his soul to the Father. In fact, before Jesus even selected his disciples, you remember, what does the Bible tell us in Luke's Gospel? He spent the whole night praying before he chose them. When's the last time you spent a whole night before you made a major decision in your life? Well, the, we don't do that. But the disciples said, hey, there's a correlation here between the spiritual power of Jesus and the way in which he's plugged in to the Father in prayer. And so they said to him, teach us, please, how to pray. And that's what I hope we can accomplish to some degree in this series.